feel like I'm on the Hitchhiker's Guide to Autism. Um, I um, just got back from Thailand, as she mentioned. I was at the Elephant um, Sanctuary in northern Thailand, where they teach elephants to paint as a form of relaxation therapy, which is pretty extraordinary. I brought back some elephant art. It's remarkable stuff. This is not painted by an elephant, but there's a bunch of elephants on it. Um, one of the things that's extraordinary to me is, you know, we've associated elephants with memory. And they have extraordinary memories uh, for various events and various patterns in their life, very much like some of our kids do, where they just, certain things they just absolutely won't forget. Like the last time they were at the doctor's office and it was a traumatic event, they'll never go back to that doctor's office without a whole tantrum and tirade. Um, but I leave here, I go back to Phoenix for a few days, uh, and then I'll be in Dubai. I come back from Dubai, um, go to Atlanta, then South Africa, Norway, Cyprus, and a few other places around the world. Why is that? Why am I traveling all over the world? Extraordinarily enough, the entire world has been visited with autism at the same time. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? How did something like that happen? You know, because diseases don't normally pattern that way. So infectious diseases tend not to hit the entire planet at the same time. There may be a plague in Europe that spares Asia. Is it because we travel and we share our germs with the entire planet? Or is this something that's not germ related? Um, we need to define the individual subsets of children that we're treating. So for me, as a clinician and as a parent, I want to know. I want to know what it is specifically about my child that has to be fixed so that they can get better, and I want to know what's specifically wrong with any individual child that I see so that I can do the very best to try and bring them out of um, the realm of autism that they're in. Now, I deal sometimes on the internet with some background chatter of people that um, enjoy and think that autism is a good thing. You know, and sometimes for high functioning, artistically gifted um, individuals with autism, it might be a really good thing. But in general, the vast majority of kids that I see are sick. Um, they have seizures, they have inflammatory bowel disease, they've got remarkable oxidative stress, they're full of toxins. That's not a good way to grow up. Everybody kind of agree with that? So if we could remove all of that, if we could give the brain and the immune system a pristine, healthy environment to grow up in, if we could do that for them, doesn't it make sense that all the therapies, the ABA, the speech, the language, and everything else should have a better chance of emerging and doing well and sticking around? And it appears that way to me. Um, I work very closely with um, ABA centers. I work with the Center for Autism Related Disorders out of California, which has offices around the world. And there's no question that their observations are when we get it right as medical doctors, when we get the biology right for the kids, that all of the behavioral stuff becomes much easier for them to program and to respond to. Uh, so instead of making two or three or four gains in the course of a week uh, or a month, they make 20 or 30 gains in the course of a week or a month. So um, I think that we can partner with each other, we can partner with therapists, and I like the team approach to all of this. But this morning I want to talk specifically about biomarkers. Now, for some of you, you're already familiar with the term biomarkers, but for some of you, biomarker might be kind of a strange term. How many of you feel like if I asked you to brought you up here to define biomarkers, you'd be uncomfortable and probably wouldn't get it right? Okay, great. So how about if I define it for you, and I'll tell you what I mean by biomarker. A biomarker is an objective, measurable, uh, quantifiable fact about an individual and their issues that will allow me to determine either what caused it or what's wrong or what I can do to monitor the response to therapy. So let's take diabetes as an example. Sugar, glucose, is a biomarker of diabetes, right? More sugar, more diabetes symptoms, more problems. If I can manage that and get that under control, then we should see some degree of improvement. That's exactly what we're talking about, except autism isn't diabetes, it's something else. Let's kind of jump into this a little bit. So this is my son, Matthew. On the left was Matthew when he was a baby. Beautiful eye contact, absolutely healthy child. He was um, in every way um, my little angel. He was just a perfect kid. Um, something happened to him. Um, somewhere around 15 to 18 months, his life started to change. Um, he stopped responding to pain. He started taking the dishes out of the cupboards and slamming pots and pans together. Um, he could fall, and he wouldn't stop his fall, and he just smashed his face into the ground. Um, Weird stuff started to happen. Now we changed his diet, we took away gluten and casein, he got a lot better. And then when he was four, he received his second MMR booster and we lost him completely. He developed seizures, um, diarrhea, inflammatory bowel disease, and every bit of language that he had left. Um, and for about a year and a half, all he could do was play with poop. He thought he was a play with a fun factory, he could make it and play with it all day long, and that was his world. That's kind of a hard place to be. 
Um, that's why it's hard for me when people say autism is a good thing, for me to look back and see my son's journey with this and say, mm, you know, that really wasn't so good. Uh, it wasn't so good for him, it wasn't so good for me, it wasn't so good for the family dog. Um, because what he really liked to do was to get a whole big handful of poop and get into the dog's hair and do some nice little self-stimulatory sort of stuff. And I can vividly remember, if, as I think about elephants and what they can't forget, I will never forget the time that our Karen Terrier walked out into the kitchen, dragging her head about this far off the floor with this very sad look on her face, completely covered head to toe, all the way down to the tip of her tail in poop. You could see that she was just asking, can you help me? Like, this is not good. I can't do anything about this. Um, Matthew, on the other side, um, has, has recovered remarkably. He just turned 15. Yesterday was his 15th birthday. Um, sadly, for about the last five birthdays, I've been on the road traveling for um, most of his birthdays, which is um, one of those sacrifices that um, he and I have decided to make, mostly on my part, uh, because my determination is that the legacy of what happened to my son it, my justification for the amount of time that I spend is to invest it in helping everybody else that I can on the planet to not visit that journey or not visit as severely as we had to go through it. Um, that's a blue iguana from Cayman Islands, and he is studying that in great detail. I mean, I, I think every little fact of that iguana was known by Matthew in terms of its external shape. How carefully have you studied your kids? How carefully have you studied them? How much do you know about them? Do you know, do, do they have inflammatory brain disease? Have you documented that? Do they have inflammatory bowel disease? Do you know? Do they have oxidative stress? Do they have inflammation? Do they have problems with detoxification? Are they full of lead or mercury? Do you know? How are you gonna know? Let's see if we can figure that out. So I have, after evaluating over 4,000 children with autism from all over the world, a hypothesis, which is that autism, oftentimes, not always, there are a few genetic causes of autism, but oftentimes, Autism is the consequences of the interaction of, the, of immune activation in the CNS, which is the brain, and peripheral immune system activation all at the same time, which generates excessive free radicals. These are oxidizers. These are the things that tend to kind of burn up um, cells, cell membranes, DNA, RNA. Free radicals damage mitochondria, cell membranes, RNA, DNA, proteins, and everything else that's important to you. So it would make sense then that various immune activators or free radical inducing toxins from the environment would cause autism or cause these sort of symptoms. So we can probably identify what a lot of those are and at the same time we can probably remove them and have the child do better. Um, this is the basis of my hypothesis to a large extent. This is from Johns Hopkins where they defined autism as an inflammatory brain disease. But that's not sufficient because autism goes beyond just an inflammatory brain disease, doesn't it? There are other symptoms of autism that we can't explain just by brain symptoms, like their eczema, their allergies, the fact that uh, if they eat a little tiny piece of bread or drink a little bit of milk by mistake that they go crazy for two or three days. This is what they found. So on the left-hand side in A is a child um, who was neurotypical but unfortunately drowned. Uh, they did an autopsy, they evaluated the cerebellum, that's the small brain, and they compared that um, they had a whole series of children without autism who drowned that they compared to a series of children with autism who drowned. Now that's obviously a tragedy, but v a lot of stuff can be learned from those kinds of studies. Um, in B, you see a child with seizures and autism. That's, a more, that's the more advanced form of injury when they start to develop seizure activity. 